All right, well, would you take your Bibles this morning? We're going to go back to 1 Thessalonians. And 1 Thessalonians, we began last week looking at um, a message about being an, an example to all. Paul says that you're an example uh, to those around you. And 1 Thessalonians, and notice chapter 1, verse number 6. We'll read this again and then move on this morning. And he says in verse 6 there, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word, notice, in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost. Verse 7, So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak Anything, for they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We saw last week beginning with examples to all, being an example to the people around us. Now, in particular, we said that he's talking to a church, being an end sample to the brotherhood of believers. And, you know, uh, again, the word people say, oh, that's, that, that's an archaic word that shouldn't be used, in sample. No, it should be. We use the word today, encourage. That means having courage within, right? Uh, we have uh, other terms like that. In sample is being a picture of what you're supposed to be to the people within, the brotherhood, the church. We're examples, E-X, uh, to the people without. That's a picture of what you're supposed to be to the people outward, without the church. And Paul uses that term end sample on at least two occasions in the New Testament. So we're to be a picture of what we're supposed to be in the Christian life to the people within. And that's what I'm talking about this morning, about being that for the other churches around us. And as we said a little bit last week, that boy, people will look at our church. Boy, you don't have very much or you're not very big. You don't have a big bank account and all those things. And you've even had to endure some hard times throughout the last year or two years, you know. And that's a good thing. And the big churches may look at us and go, man, if they can do it, we can do it. They're a great example or in sample to the brotherhood around us. And that's what Paul is saying here to the church at Thessalonica. And you know that. Now this church, you know, was in a major city. It was a large city. It was a trade city. Many people coming and going from the port, coming in and out. And uh, there was a lot of idolatry within this church, or I should say this community. And then he says, you turn from God, from, excuse me, from the idols to God. And there in verse number 9. You turned from idols to serve the living and the true God. There's many instances in scriptures about that. And one of the best examples you can set for the people around you, the other believers around you, is what? To have faith in God and turning away from those things that are false and not true. A lot of idols around us. A lot of people worship today, as you know. They worship sports. They worship uh, other things, cars and money, obviously, and such the like. And we ought to be very careful. But the greatest example you can set to fellow believers is that of turning to God in true faith and heart faith. One thing I think about our church, that we could be a shining example to other churches, is our faith. Our faith. Well, how are you going to do that? You don't have the finances. By faith. How are you going to step? How are you going to reach this community? You, you, you don't have the manpower by faith, right? Faith. And that's what people are looking for today. A church, a pastor, church people that are faith filled. They're willing to go the extra mile. They're willing to step out by faith. Are you willing to walk by faith and not by sight? As Paul later says. So we saw that. Now, bringing back to chapter two, we started a little bit and he talks about and brings in and starts out and says, you know how we were shamefully entreated at Philippi. You know how that they mistreated us, put us in prison, they beat us unlawfully, all of those things. And he says that uh, your faith, though, encouraged us. Your faith helped us. Um, he says, uh, verse 13, notice chapter 2, verse 13, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Right? That believe. Now we think about this. Um, they came to Thessalonica and they didn't have to, as we said, hold their hands and baby these people. 
Okay, now get together. Okay, now read the Bible. Okay, now don't do that. That's sinful. No. The church of Thessalonica was a mature church. It's a picture of a very mature church. And he says, you already were faithful. You already were doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? Man, the happiest parents in the world are, have kids that are one step ahead of them. <laughs> I already did that, Dad. I already took the trash out. I already did the dishes, Mom. Right? Uh, I tried to do the dishes the other night. I know, it's a shock. I know. I tried it, and it was a mess. And I did it on purpose. You know, so she, oh, just, just leave that alone. Let me handle it. I said, oh, man, nuts. <laughs> But are you ever getting away? You'd one step ahead of somebody. I'll do that for you. I already got that done. I can handle that. I know what to do. Uh, are you faith-filled? Do you have enough faith to believe that we can do this? And the church says, amen. It's not a church that goes, well, pastor, no. Ah, he's wanting to do that again. He's wanting to step out by faith again. He's wanting to do this for the Lord again. I don't know if we can do it. We understand and say that, see that the church here at Thessalonica was a church that was already there. He says there in chapter 1, verse 8, he says, Your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. We don't have to come to you and exhort you or babysit you. You're already there. You're a shining example. Now we see here, again, the grand entrance that we said last week. They didn't come to a people and uh, they were hiding, a people that were hindered, a people that were, uh, that were truly scared, but they were bold people. They were unafraid to stand for Christ. There was the gratitude expressed there. A gratitude, he says, oh, we're so thankful for you. Verse 13 of chapter 2, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Thank we God without ceasing. Now, why did he thank God? A couple things here, the gratitude expressed to this church for taking the word of God as the Word of God. A lot of people today, a lot of churches, take the Word of God not as the Word of God, do they? It's not the Word of God. They take the Word of God and say, well, it's a good book. Well, I question its authority. I question its authenticity. I question its infallibility. I question its, what, inspiration. It's a good book, but I don't know if it's truly God's Word. No. He says you took the Word of God as the Word of God. And it's not until we take the Word of God as the very words of God, that the Word of God will have an effectual work in our lives. It's not until you take the Word of God and say, I acknowledge it's the Word of God. It's literal words of God. He's given it to me by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that it will have an effectual work. You ever had co-workers or friends read the Bible? Or you've heard people that are unbelievers read the Bible and they read it. Well, I read the Bible through and I didn't see anything. It didn't change me. I think it's, I, I think it's a bunch of fairy tales. Why? Because they don't take the Bible as the Bible. They don't take it as the Word of God, which we take it as. It's the very Word of God. And when you submit your life and heart to the Word of God, number one step, faith cometh by what? Hearing? Hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God changes you by salvation. But you take it as the Word of God. It effectually, notice, works in you. It changes you. It transforms you. It makes you a new creature. And you read the Bible now today in your daily devotions, in your private time. And you ask the Lord to move and speak. And He does, doesn't He? The Bible changes you. It stirs you. It stirs you. People today that claim to be Christians, that have no moving of the Spirit in their lives, have no joy of the Lord, have nothing of that nature, have no uh, uh, filling of the Spirit, if you will. Why? They don't spend time in the Scriptures. We know that. They don't take the Bible as the Bible. If you did, you would spend time in it. you take it wholly and heartily. Now notice, he thanked them for that. But also doing so, taking the Bible at face value, or literally we say, it brings opposition. It brings opposition. Um, notice verse 14 here, chapter 2. For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Because they took the word of God seriously to heart, and it changed them, it brought opposition to their lives. That's all it always happens. Why do you do what you do? Well, the Bible says, oh, no, that's wrong. Why do you live the way you do? We talked about a while back, but the whole crux of the Reformation period was what? People taking the Bible literally for what it was. The people taking the Bible and saying, the Bible's the word of God. I'm going to live the Bible. And it brought about a Reformation period, but many people were martyred and killed because of that. And this church here at Thessalonica, they were persecuted. They suffered for following the Scriptures. They suffered for following the Word of God. Not only the Jews that 
persecuted them, but he says their own countrymen, your own people. We want faith with no foes. We want a religion with no recourse. We want a belief with no bias. But it's not going to happen. We take the word of God literally as our guide and rule. We call it our final authority. It's going to bring a great opposition. Now at our church here, you know that. And I pray in your own home, in your own lives. The Bible is our final authority. It is. And everything we say, do, speak, believe. In all matters of faith and practice, we say that's what we believe and that's why we do what we do. That's because of the Bible. And, and we follow the Bible. We stick to the Bible. Why do you do what you do? It's the Bible way. And it brings opposition to your life. It brings opposition to your family, your marriage, your children, your finances. Do you know when you follow the Bible's rule book for finances, you're going to suffer? <laughs> when you follow that, you don't go, ooh, I could save that to buy this. I could do this to... What do you do? Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Lord, what do you want me to do with this extra income? Boy, I could really use it to pay for this over here, but what, do, what does the Lord do? He shows us. It's better to what? It's better to give than receive. Uh, will a man rob God? Wherein have we robbed thee? He says, in tithes and offerings. We live for you, Lord. We've done everything you want us to do, Lord. What do you mean rob you in tithes and offerings? Uh, we wonder why. Now you follow through with the Bible, and I could go through many, many things the Bible preaches or teaches us, and we would maybe suffer. Now again, you don't suffer when you follow the Bible. As the world looks at it, they're saying, boy, you're suffering. You're going without. You don't have very much. No, you have the joy of the Lord. You're filled with the Spirit. Now let me say, they were taking, and they were applying the Word of God. We see that. Um, verse 17, notice if you will. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, notice this, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. And he said, we wanted to come to you, and we wanted to see you, we wanted to love on you, and, and uh, in the brotherhood, and, and shake your hands and see how it's going. He says, Satan hindered us. And Satan will hinder you. We looked at Wednesday night. Satan's going to hinder you. Satan wants to cause casualties in the brotherhood, in the Christian faith. He wants to destroy our children's minds, doesn't he? He wants to destroy our marriages. If he can break your marriage up, he's got you. He wants to destroy you as a man of God and a woman of God. If he can take your pure mind from you and contaminate it, he wants to hinder everything in your life. Now, this church came. Again, talking about this church being an example to the brotherhood, to the believers, to other churches. Satan will hinder you. And the more Satan hinders you, the more Satan attacks you. I don't know, some of you have probably been attacked by Satan this week. That's a good thing. You must be doing something right. You must be doing something for the Lord. When you follow him, I wonder why, God, why the Lord allows so many of these things. Why is Satan always against me? Why? You're doing something for God. And Paul says we're living, we're starting churches, we're planting churches, we're seeing people saved, and Satan has hindered us. Satan's hindered us. So there's a gratitude expressed. There's a real enemy, we know. And there's a purpose. Notice for their ministry. Notice verse 19, the purpose of Paul's ministry. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. And Paul says... When we stand before Christ one day, we're going to get to look at you as a group of a, a church over here. Thessalon Thessalonica Baptist Church over here. Who did that? Oh, I, Paul, Paul, I, I started that. I started that. He says, you're our, our crown, you're our joy. You're, you're what we rejoice in because we get to see the great faith. I said, we know John later will say, I have no greater joy than to see or to hear my children walking in truth. And I Pray that's your prayer as well. But you're our glory, you're our joy, he says, the very real ministry. When we see Christ at his coming, we are warned not to come empty-handed. We know that. Paul will earlier say in the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, but he says that we ought to come and there will be things that will offer, be wood, hay, and stubble or gold, precious stone. It'll consume on the fire, the altar, the refining fire, if you will. We stand before him one day, I pray that. He says, you're our crown. You're our joy. Let me say here, secondly, there's a good report. A good report. Now, as he says here, chapter 3, notice, Wherefore we 
could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. Sent Timotheus, our brother, minister of God, and our fellow helper, and the gospel of Christ to establish you, comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved, notice, by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Now Paul moves on in his ministry, you know that. He goes there to Athens and he sends Timothy back to check up on the church. And he says, I want you to go back to Thessalonica, that great church, and I want you to make sure everyone's doing okay. I want you to make sure that their faith has not been shaken. They've gone through a great persecution, gone through great things, great trials. And he says, I'm fearful that their faith is going to be shaken and broken. I'm not going to no longer serve God. They're no longer going to stand for him. How many people do we know that no longer serve God? No longer go to church. No longer are faithful on the bus route. No longer are faithful teaching Sunday school and preaching the word of God. They went by the wayside. He says, I'm, I'm fearful that because of the opposition and Satan hindering you, your faith. But Timothy went back, you know that, and he reported back to Paul. And he says, Paul, don't worry. They're still good. Don't worry, Paul. They're still good. Don't worry. I hope here in 10, 20, 30 years, whoever the Lord would allow us to be here, and Terry is coming and let us live. The people report back. How's that church doing out there that started? I, I forgot to talk. About, I forgot to pray for that church. I haven't talked to them in 10, 20 years. They're still good. They're still growing. They're still building. They're still established. They're still moving on. And Timothy says, Paul, don't worry. They're still going. They're still going. They're still going. They're still keeping at it. They're still staying by the doctrine. Paul, we know, had a great concern for this church. The church was experiencing some persecution, some afflictions from their own countrymen, as he said. And Paul was fearful that this constant persecution would drive them from the faith. Again, never feel that you're alone when going through some trial difficulty in life. Know there's a church family. Know there's a pastor. Know there's fellow people that are praying for you, concerned for you. And again, that's what's amazing about a local church. A local church. That you can come together. And that you can lock arms, you can pray for each other and encourage each other and help each other, right? That's what it's about. And people that don't have that, I feel so bad for them. But he says, don't, in verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Notice a, a seeming contradiction. Though. For yourselves know that we are appointed therein too. Wait, you, you mean we're appointed unto great blessings and benefit? Paul? No, no. We're appointed unto afflictions. That's the Christian life, isn't it? The Christian life. When you think about it. That's what we're going through, and the greatest Christians know that. The people that know the Bible and take the Word of God for the Word of God as it's supposed to, they know that, and they're not moved by that. Moved. You might want to underline that in your Bible. Moved, verse 3, meaning put off course, taken out of the race. It brings opposition. The church was experiencing great difficulty. Paul says, you saw firsthand what I was talking about when we face persecutions with you. Verse 4, notice, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulations, as ye, uh, even as it came to pass, as ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. Lest by some means, notice here, the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. See, Paul had already established some churches and gone through and tried to reach people where their faith was in vain. He had already done that. Your faith, what happened to family so-and-so? They, they left. Oh, man. What happened to that church we tried to start over in Philippi? They're doing all right. Man, their labor was in vain. One of the greatest burdens for a child of God, especially a minister of God, is that they reach the people and labor in study and preparation and helping and especially in prayer for people. And what happens? They go by the wayside. And their labor was in vain. They did all of that. Did all of that. Their labor was in vain. You ever done something for somebody? They never even acknowledged it. So didn't do anything. Didn't say thanks, didn't give you a kick in the behind, nothing. I mean, you would have taken anything, right? Nothing. Paul says, I don't want our labor to be in vain. There's a tempter that will tempt you to quit. What does he tempt us with? Quitting. What does he tempt us with? Apathy, laziness. I believe in Christ. I love the Lord. I love the church. I love the Bible. But pff, I don't know. Don't feel like it. I don't feel like going. I don't feel like being a part of that. I don't feel like putting in the time. He'll tempt us. He'll tempt us. In so many ways, I won't get into that this morning. But a, a good report. He wanted a good report of the church. He saw firsthand. He had a great love for the churches. Great love. There was churches around him and around this city of Thessalonica, like the region of Galatia, where Paul had to write back to the 
book in the book of Galatians to these churches in this area and say, hey, listen, you guys need to remember to do this and that. Don't go back to the law. Don't go back to serving false idols. Don't go back. There was a church in the city of Corinth that he started. He had to write to and correct them on things. And he had to encourage them. He had to help them. But this church was different. This church was different. Paul says, I, I'm encouraged by you, but I also warn you. You're a great church. You're a loving church. But I warn you, there's a tempter. There's one that will hinder you. There's examples all around you. Now, he had a great love. We see here, I'll skip ahead, but Timothy, you know, he comes and he gives a report. Verse 6, now Timotheus came from you unto us. He came back to Paul and brought us a good brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have a good remembrance of us, always desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Paul says, you remember us? <laughs> yeah. You remember what, what, what I did for you back in? They say, oh, Paul, Paul, we know that. We appreciate that. Do you remember when, when it, yes, Paul, we know, we're so thankful. And when Timothy came, he said, thank God that you're still there. Thank God that you're still there. Thank God you're still working. Thank God you're still moving. Thank God you're still ministering. And one of the greatest things, as I said last week, you can do is be faithful. Just be faithful. I don't do much. and I don't know if I'm getting fed there. and I don't know if anything's happening. I don't know. Be faithful. Man, I'm so thankful for our church. You dear people are faithful, just faithful, faithful <clears throat> among the many other things you do. Faithful. And Paul was so greatly stirred by this. Notice verse 7, therefore, brethren, we were comforted, comforted over you in what? All our affliction and distress by your faith. Paul was beaten, you know. You know what happened at Athens when he was there. All that took place. He went to the tomb of the unknown God. Uh, there's a guy standing up there, an orator. Going, oh, we're at the tomb of the unknown God. And, and Paul says, well, I know who the God is. <laughs> He's not unknown. You do? And it says, some believed and some mocked. And some said, we'll hear you on this matter later. All the things he's going through. He just came out of Philippi where he was publicly whipped and beaten and thrown in prison unlawfully shamefully entreated, and then he goes, I can't do any more. I'm not going to show up to church one more time. I can't stand up and do this one more time. There's too much. There's too... And then he thought, wait, but the church at Thessalonica, hey, they're still faithful. They're still going. They're still going. They're still at it. They're still faithful, and they're enduring temptations and trials. Listen, can I say today, you don't know what kind of effect you have on other people around you. You don't know that your parents are watching and waiting 300 miles away, or your family, your sisters, or brothers, your cousins. You don't know that. You don't know the effect you may have on them just by being faithful to God, just by staying in your Bible, just by staying true to God. And Paul says, you were a comfort to us in our affliction. In our distress. You know what that word distress means? Stress. Paul was stressed out. It's okay, by the way, to be stressed out. You're stressed out, you're not right with God. No, that's not true. You're stressed out. You've got all these burdens on you, all these problems, all these things. You're stressed. Paul says, you know what, though? We were comforted by your faith. Verse 8, and I'll, I'll wrap it up. For now we live, notice, if ye stand fast in the Lord. We live. Paul, Timothy, Silvanus, all the people with him, we live. We have purpose in life. We can go another day if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. In your faith. They were comforted. You may not know until you get to heaven, but there are little boys and little girls that maybe you taught in Sunday school. You'll never see till you get to heaven, right? Hey, hey, remember me? No. <laughs> you tell me back uh, 10 years ago, so. Hey, remember me? Uh, no. You'll never know. You'll never know somebody that you may have left a track at a table or a track at the uh, grocery store or somewhere. You may never know. You may not even know some of your family members that you never thought could give a who <laughs> about your faith and about your stand for God. 
till you get to heaven and they go, it's because of you, it's because of your stand, it's because of your in sample to me. It's because of what you did. And Paul says, listen, you'll never know how much you mean to us. You never know how I sat in a dirty, rat-infested prison cell with beat, whip marks on my back, bleeding and sore and tired and cold and sick to my stomach. And I thought about you and it encouraged me. You never know. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Be an example. You think about that today. Don't let some discouragement distract you from your purpose. Don't let some affliction, some temptation, some hindrance that Satan tries to throw, put a stick in your spokes and tries to put some uh, construction cones in your highway, get you off track. Don't let that distract you from the purpose. Don't let a trial or burden keep you from serving people, serving God. Keep going. Be an example. Paul says, we live if ye stand. If you quit, then I know that I didn't do something right. Something happened. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Don't quit. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with what? The yoke of bondage. He says to the book, in the book of Galatians. And then let me say this lastly here. Paul's desire was for these people to increase and abound. Verse 12, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. Now again, His desire for them was that they would stand before Christ, not empty-handed, not empty-handed, but to see them again, abound and increase in love. Notice that, increase. He tried to encourage the church at Corinth, you remember, in the last chapter there, verse, uh, or in the closing chapter, excuse me, of 1 Corinthians 15, what's he say? Keep going, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know what? Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If you keep going, if you keep staying at it, he tried to encourage these churches. So are you today an example? Are you a prime ensample? I keep using that term of the brother in, in, within the church and the churches around us. Are you that for them? Now be an example, obviously, to the, to the worldly people on the outside. We already know that. We already know that. And they're going to persecute us just for living for God and staying righteous and following the Word of God. But be an end sample to the people within the church, the people that are around you that you do know are saved. Other kids, right? Cousins and friends, classmates and co-workers. Be an end sample to those people. Let them say, well, brother, I don't think I can go one bit longer. I'm just too stressed. I'm too discouraged. I don't know what to do. And then they think of you. They think of your family, your marriage, your kids, your faithfulness. Hey, if they can do it, I can do it. Are you an example to those around you? I hope you are. An example to all, all the people around you. Amen. All right, let's pray this morning, Lord. Thank you again for an opportunity to share your word today. So thankful for these that are so faithful, God, each and every week. I pray you'd help us, myself especially, to be that in sample to the brotherhood, to the people around us. Father, other churches think about us or pray for us. Uh, other people think about us as individuals, Lord. They would say, you know what? I can do it. I can do it. I can keep going. And Paul had such a love and desire for this church. We're so thankful to get a glimpse of that. And as Paul and his, his cohorts, his, his helpers there were going through such trial and difficulty and stress, they said, when we thought about you as a church, we were encouraged. What a joy, Lord, and we so thank you for that. Help us to be just that to those around us. How we love you and thank you again for the word of God, for the local church. And thank you, Father, for a meeting place today. In the Holy Spirit, the word of God, we thank and love you. Pray you guide us the rest of this week. Help us, Lord. Bring us back tonight if you'd allow it. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Thank you.